eukaryotic cells, like the ones depicted here, can be extremely complex. And since they compose multicellular plants, animals, and fungi, they are of great interest to us. However, about half the history of life existed without any eukaryotic cells, even though as simpler eukaryotic organisms, the protists. So bacteria were the only living things on planet Earth from around 3.5 billion years ago uh, to uh, about 2 billion years ago or later. So prior to 2 billion years ago, there were two domains of life, the eubacteria, the true bacteria we are most familiar with, and the archaea, a group of prokaryotic cells, uh, many of which live in extreme environments. However, by 1.5 billion years ago, there were three domains of living things on Earth, the eubacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryotes. How could this have happened? How could a world filled only with small, simple prokaryotes then become a world which includes larger, complex eukaryotes? Well, first it needs to be said that prokaryotes are far more diverse than most of us appreciate or that anyone fully understands. For example, some are quite large, larger than many eukaryotes. Some eukaryotes are quite small. There is certainly great variation in complexity, with some uh, prokaryotes having an infolding of their cell membranes, or even a membrane around their DNA, uh, features which we often associate only with eukaryotes. One of the main events in the origin of the first eukaryotic cells was that of endosymbiosis, where cells from one of the domains of life began to live inside the cells from the other domain of life. And so thus eukaryotic cells, the ancestors of protists, plants, fungi, and animals, are chimeras having inherited uh, genes and traits from both of these separate domains of life, eubacteria and archaea. For many genes sampled, eukaryotic genes are far more similar to the genes of archaea than to eubacteria and archaea possess many genetic mechanisms uh, which they share with eukaryotes which are absent in eubacteria. So the genetic evidence supports that uh, the host organism arose from archaeal cells. This is unfortunate in a way because archaea are often found in extreme environments and thus very difficult to isolate and study. In fact, many uh, of the genetic sequences which are most similar to those of eukaryotes from uh, archaeal cells have been isolated um, from samples uh, from extreme environments where cells could not be collected, just nucleic acid. Since 2010, it has become known that there are archaea known as the Asgard archaea, a new superphylum which are very similar to eukaryotes. They include genes for the cytoskeleton and actin genes and actin-related protein genes, most closely related to eukaryotes. They can produce membrane vesicles and then protrusions from the membrane. And some have been observed to be in a symbiotic relationship with other types of bacteria so that these protrusions can help in the exchange of materials. Might this be a precursor to endosymbiosis? Thus, evidence at present suggests that the proto-eukaryotic cell was an archaeal prokaryote in the Asgard superphylum. Given the characteristics of this group, it is thought to have been anaerobic, metabolizing hydrogen gas, which probably shared some features with modern eukaryotes like cytoskeleton proteins. It is not known whether it already possessed a nucleus or where a nucleus might have come from. 
uh, since there are uh, multiple models. So for example, some bacteria already possess a membrane around uh, their DNA. Um, and another model suggests that perhaps a virus was instrumental in separating a DNA region where transcription occurs, which would be separate from where translation occurs. Viruses can do this, but no known prokaryotic cell does. Um, that either one of these might have been instrumental in establishing a nucleus. Um, but there is no evidence firmly supporting either yet at this point.